Hello, and thanks for stopping by. Overlooking the River Thames between Westminster and Pimlico, Tate Britain is one of London's cultural gems. A gallery where you can view artworks by the likes of J.M.W. Turner, Henry Moore, David Hockney, Francis Bacon, and many more. As you can see, it's a real oasis of calm here, isn't it? So, it may come as some surprise then, to discover that the spot upon which I'm now standing was once occupied by a very different type of institution. That being a huge, brutal prison, known as the Millbank Penitentiary. In its day, the Millbank Penitentiary was a symbol of utter dread. One of the most terrible London prisons, as one report put it. Although despite this, it did start out with good intentions. The jail was first proposed in the late 18th century by Jeremy Bentham, the philosopher and social reformer who is especially noted for the role he played in establishing University College London. Bentham was so closely associated with the university in fact, which was the first in Britain to accept students regardless of whatever religion they practiced, that in his will he requested his body be used for medical science, after which it was to be preserved and put on display within the college. When he died in 1832, this wish was adhered to, and you can still view his body today. The auto icon, as Bentham himself called it, is housed within a glass cabinet inside the student centre on Gordon Street, which is open to the public between 7am and 7pm. If you are a student here though, you can view it 24-7, although I'm not sure I'd fancy encountering Mr Bentham's corpse at 2 in the morning, if I'm honest with you. In case you're wondering by the way, the head isn't real, it's a wax replica. What you see here is Bentham's skeleton, dressed in a set of his original clothes. Nice, eh? Bentham's real head does still exist though. It's mummified and stored privately elsewhere in the university. I'll refrain from showing it here though as it's probably a little too gruesome for some, although there are plenty of images available online if your curiosity gets the better of you. We'll look at the Millbank Penitentiary itself in just a moment, but before we do, I'd like to introduce you to this video sponsor, My Heritage. As you can probably tell, I adore history, especially when it has a social angle, and I found that exploring your own ancestry is a wonderful and often very moving way of connecting with the past. My Heritage makes this process both fun and easy. You begin by building your family tree. Here's mine. It's still a work in progress, but as my heritage offers access to over 18 billion records, it's sure to grow pretty fast. As Europe's number one family history service, my heritage is trusted by 90 million users. That's a lot of people, so it's a safe bet that you'll find someone out there that you had no idea existed. I've already found myself falling down several rabbit holes, and that's because the level of detail available is breathtaking. The collection catalogue, for example, contains several thousand databases from across the world, covering everything from birth, marriage and death directories, to censuses and military records. This particular database, for example, lists passengers who travelled between Ireland and New York in the mid-19th century. My surname's Lorden, which comes from Cork in Ireland, so type that in and a few matches flash up. Mary Lorden? John Lorden? I wonder where this could lead. Furthermore, my heritage features some incredible photo enhancement tools. Let's try them out with this image. This gentleman is Harry Hewish, an ancestor of mine who fought in the Great War. That crease in the corner has always annoyed me. It's been there as long as I've known this photo. So, let's use the repair tool to smooth it out. And now let's use the enhance button to sharpen things up. And finally, let's add a bit of colour. Pretty incredible, isn't it? You can bring old photos to life even further by animating them. Here's a group of my grandfather's friends taken in a pub somewhere in Kilburn in the 1950s. Now watch this. You can enjoy all of these incredible features by signing up to My Heritage for a 14-day free trial. And if you decide to continue your subscription, you'll get a 50% discount. Furthermore, Make sure you don't miss the chance to get a DNA kit, which MyHeritage are currently offering at their lowest ever price. You'll find the link to MyHeritage in the description below. 
Thanks for watching and now back to the video. By the 18th century, incarceration was increasingly being used in Britain as a form of punishment, as opposed to earlier methods of castigation such as public humiliation and execution for what we'd now deem minor offences. Early prisons however were atrocious places, overcrowded, chock full of disease and prone to corruption, which led many people to view them as a blight on society. Jeremy Bentham therefore proposed a new, and for the time, revolutionary prison design, which he called the Panopticon, derived from the Greek for all-seeing, a spacious circular structure in which the cells would be arranged around a single central watchtower, from where guards could easily keep an eye on every single inmate. Bentham described the concept as a mill for grinding rogues honest, and his theory was that, by being subjected to constant surveillance, inmates would be conditioned to behave within an orderly prison environment. Looking to put his scheme into practice, Bentham oversaw the purchase of a plot of land in 1799 in the area known as Millbank, which at the time was relatively rural. It took its name from a mill, owned by Westminster Abbey no less, which was once located here. The project struggled to get off the ground though, leaving Bentham to abandon the Panopticon concept, although a number of jails adhering to his design would later be built in various parts of the world. The best known example perhaps being Cuba's Presidio Modelo, which was in operation between 1928 and 1967. Although the Panopticon had been ditched, the government were still keen to build a prison, which they intended to be Britain's first national penitentiary, on the Millbank site and so in 1812, a competition was held to find a new design. This was won by William Williams, a military architect, and after a few hiccups, the task of managing the construction was handed to Robert Smirk, the architect who would later become famous for designing the British Museum's main block. Building the prison proved to be a real headache, the main problem being that the land was extremely marshy, it was beside the Thames after all, and was so boggy in fact, that it was impossible to lay decent foundations. To overcome this, Smirk devised a vast concrete raft, which was sunk into the sodden ground. As you can imagine, such engineering didn't come cheap, and the final bill for constructing a prison came in at £500,000, approximately 38 million in today's money. When it opened in June 1816, the Millbank Penitentiary was Britain's largest prison, and it was indeed huge. As well as covering the space now occupied by Tate Britain, it stretched as far west as Regency Street, north to Vincent Street, and south to Ponsonby Place, whilst the modern day John Islip Street would have run through the middle. Built from tough Scottish Kalalo stone, the prison was also very complex in design. It was hexagonal in shape, and consisted of six petal shaped wings, all fanning out around a single chapel at the centre. Each wing was three storeys high and contained five courtyards, and in all the prison contained 1500 cells. If this layout sounds confusing, then well that's because it was. Even the guards struggled to navigate their way around the grim labyrinth. You can get a good idea of how the interior appeared from this account published in the Penny Illustrated Paper in 1865. If the ground plan of the building at Millbank is a geometrical prison, we're told, then the interior is assuredly an eccentric maze. Long, dark and narrow corridors and twisting passages in which the visitor, unaccustomed to the dubious twilight, has to fill his way, whilst double locked doors, opening at all sorts of queer angles, sometimes lead into blind entries. Similar accounts of the prison noted that its many interior staircases were steep, twisting and unlit, whilst the walls were tall, dark and caked in mud. The first group of inmates to enter the Millbank Penitentiary in 1816 were all female, with the first male contingent arriving a few months later in January 1817. These early convicts had all been due to be transported to Australia, but in their mercy, the courts had deemed them capable of redemption, and so commuted their sentences to prison terms, ranging between 5 and 10 years. In hindsight though, it's likely these prisoners wished they had been shipped to Oz after all, for despite being brand spanking new, 
the Millbank Penitentiary rapidly transformed into a very grim place indeed. Bread and water was the only sustenance available and inmates were granted just five minutes of exercise per day. Silence was expected at all times and anyone caught breaking the rules could expect to be either whipped or placed in irons. To add to the inmates woes, sanitary was appalling too, without breaks of cholera, dysentery and scurvy all being recorded made all the more unpleasant by the stench of the nearby Thames, which in those days was little more than an open sewer. In 1823, just seven years after the prison had opened, the Morning Chronicle claimed that there was only one solution to the prison's problems, that's being to, quote, place as much gunpowder under the foundation as may suffice to blow the whole fabric into the air. By 1843, the prison had grown so decrepit that Parliament, who were only located less than a mile away, decided that the facility was no longer fit for holding inmates long term. Consequently, the Millbank Penitentiary was demoted to a general depot for all convicts, essentially turning it into a large holding centre, where those who had been sentenced to transportation were sent to await a place on a prison ship bound for Australia. Such a wait could last anywhere up to three months, and by 1859, it was estimated that the site was processing between four and 5,000 convicts per year. During its time as a holding centre, it said that two terms associated with Australian phraseology originated within the Millbank Penitentiary. The first of these is Down Under, which some have speculated referred to a passageway connecting the prison to the Thames. When their number came up, prisoners would supposedly be escorted down under through this tunnel and out to the river where their arduous voyage to Australia would finally commence. The second term is POM, Aussie slang for a British person of course, which it's said derives from the initials POM, short for Prisoner of Millbank, which was stamped on all of the inmates scratchy brown uniforms. Remember, these are only theories, and there are certainly others as to where the phrase has originated, so please do let me know your own thoughts in the comments. Transportation as a punishment ceased in 1867, by which point around 162,000 convicts had made the long voyage to Australia. After that, the Millbank Penitentiary became a military jail, before finally closing for good in 1890. Due to its solid construction, it took several years to demolish and it was whilst this lengthy process was going on that the sugar magnate, Sir Henry Tate, donated his collection of 65 paintings along with £80,000 to build a gallery to display them in to the nation. The soon to be vacant site at Millbank therefore was selected as the site for the new gallery, despite concerns that it wasn't near South Kensington, in other words alongside the Science Museum, Natural History Museum and so on and that dampness from the Thames could potentially damage the paintings, fears of course which have since proved unfounded. Originally known as the National Gallery of British Art, the Tate opened in 1897. Today, barely anything of the old Millbank Penitentiary survives, although there are a couple of echoes if you know where to look. On the junction of Ponsby Place and Corston Street for example, there is a clear bend in the road. This line once followed the perimeter of the prison's wall. Nearby, on Curitan Street, behind Wilkie House, you can see this part of an old concrete trench which once ran around the dreaded building. It's now used by residents as a place to dry laundry and grow vegetables. Although you can't see it of course, part of Smirk's huge concrete raft still remains buried deep beneath ground, along with a mystery metal object, believed to be an old cell door, which was detected by a bomb disposal squad in 1959. Back up above ground, there are two bollards, both of which stood outside the prison and have since been shifted to different positions. The first can be seen on Millbank, at the edge of Riverside Walk Gardens, and the other is tucked away in a small courtyard off of Atterbury Street, just across from the gallery. Last, but not to least, there's perhaps the most unlikely connection, the Morpeth Arms pub, which was built in the mid 1840s primarily as a watering hole for thirsty guards employed at the prison. Naturally, the pub is said to be haunted by a former inmate, whose spirit supposedly lurks down under in the cellar.
Thanks so much for watching. I hope you found this look at the Millbank Penitentiary interesting and would love to hear your own thoughts on this long lost prison. Were you aware it even existed? And what did you reckon about the theories regarding the origins of the terms POM and Down Under? Please be sure to let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed this video and haven't done so already, then I'd really appreciate it if you could please consider subscribing to my channel, as this, along with clicking the bell icon to receive notifications, will ensure you don't miss out whenever I publish a new Rob's London episode. And it goes without saying, of course, that it'd be great to have you along. If you're feeling extra generous, you can also support me via my Ko-fi page, or alternatively, by using the YouTube thanks button, which appears below the video as a heart icon. Any donations are of course greatly appreciated, and play a big part in helping me make videos. If you're interested in merchandise, I have an Etsy store too, Rob's Online Designs, where you'll find an array of hand illustrated mugs, featuring designs of tube trains, taxis, buses and so on. I'll leave a link to that, along with my Kofi page, in the description. For now though, thanks again friends, stay well and please be sure to stay tuned. Thank you.